From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. Today's show came out of a phone conversation that Ken Drews and I were having the other day when I found myself confessing to him that I'd let things in my containers get, shall we say, a tad overgrown this season without the pressure of any visitors and tours to keep me in line. And how I was finally trying to get them back into shape for the rest of the season by pinching things. And just for fun, how I've been rooting some of the pinched off bits in little jars of water. So all that's to say, Ken is here and we're going to talk about a little midsummer rejuvenation and also some of the less obvious positive effects that can yield. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. I don't need to introduce my friend Ken Drews, and today's topic is midsummer rejuvenation, as I said. And hello, Ken. I don't want to waste <laughs> any time with an introduction of you. Are we getting facelifts? Facelifts. Midsummer rejuvenation. <laughs> rehydration. <Okay>. Cool. <laughs> cool. So, um, no, should, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but I should say before we start, I think this is going to be one where we're going to give away another copy of your Making More Plants book, which oh, we did a month or two ago. And it so was nice. so super popular. So, with the transcript of the show, we'll have all the info on that. But seriously, I, I called you the other day and I'm like, oh, it's a mess. Everything's so overgrown. And I'm telling you about my coleus that's overtaken the uh, anise hyssop and the salvia is swamped by the whatever. And, you know, and you're laughing at me. And so what's the time for, Ken, <laughs> besides facelifts? Well, just, just because you aren't having guests visit doesn't mean you let the whole thing go to pot, you know, Ooh, <laughs> or your gonna, pots go to pot. <laughs> oh, he's going to discipline me first publicly <laughs> out loud on the radio. <laughs> well, you said you were pinching things so they get kind of thicker, but you may, it may be time to cut stuff back. I guess I'm, I'm using a, a modest sounding verb, but yeah, you're right. Some cutbacks. Well, you know, I have these big bowls. You've been here and, you know, people who have visited have seen them. They're like big, low terracotta bowls on the patio and other places. They're kind of, you know, and I group smaller pots around them, but they're the sort of the big statement centerpiece things for my annuals usually. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it, not everything grows at the same rate and you put it all in when it's small, you know, little things from the garden center, but then some things grow more lushly than others. And so like the coleus, for instance. Oh my gosh. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, when you're cutting those coleus back, you, you mentioned that you could root them in water. You can also in some situations just stick them back in the same container. If you've got space and then that'll get even more lush and full without hanging over and losing its bottom leaves and stuff. You know, because when you when you pinch or break off that parent plant, it's going to branch. And you'll get more leaves on that one. And then you have these pieces that you can either stick in or root in water. Or I like to use perlite. Oh, okay. So containers with like a pot of perlite? Yeah, I, I have a small pot of perlite, and I moisten the perlite, tamp it down really hard, and that really seems to help, and then I drill a hole in the perlite with a pencil and stick in my cutting and firm the perlite back around the cut end again. And you want to remove a couple of the bottom leaves of the cutting. The cutting's about four to six nodes long, so it's depending on the type of plant three to five inches long. And some some plants like coleus might root in two to four weeks. And then you have a new plant with roots and you carefully pry it out of the perlite. Or in the case of water, you want to move it when the roots are less than an inch and a half long. Uh, and they have, sometimes roots made in water have a little trouble 
adjusting to a lower oxygen or a higher oxygen medium. But anyway, you can stick them back in the same container that you took them from, or just what you need, Margaret, another container of coleus, right? I definitely need that. That's absolutely what I need, because I'm doing such a good job managing the ones that I have this year. <laughs> but seriously, it has been kind of an epic year in the sense of um, we all, our, our realities are, are changed um, completely. You know, our patterns of life are changed. I mean, I'm stating the obvious. And... And then on top of that, in our region and many other regions, there's been severe weather. So we have had, uh, I've had almost no rain until Mm. a hurricane. In fact, I should ask you, how did you do during the hurricane? That was just a couple of days ago. I had a couple of inches of rain, outages for a day or two, but not terrible, terrible, like many areas nearby had much worse. And I know you were praying for rain. I'll say a lot of areas, there are still places in New Jersey that don't have electricity. Yeah. We lost power for almost 24 hours, but we had five and a half inches of rain, and then that stopped, and then the wind came, and the wind was really a lot of wind, but uh, knock wood, knock trees. Yeah. And I've got dead tree, dead trees here, so I thought, uh-oh, that's going to be yeah. something. Yeah. There, was, there was one stick about four and a half feet long from the ash tree that was stuck into the lawn straight up. It's always funny when that happens in a big storm when it it's almost like a spear gets thrown yeah, and right. it yeah and it really lands like right as if someone inserted it with with force well someone did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I had a couple of inches rain and I keep saying to myself is this whole year the theme weather wise has been it never rains but it pours. It won't rain for a month practically oh, and then we get that's the These way torrential is. gully washers. And crazy. sometimes it, it's almost no rain. Yeah. It it's a water. half an hour of tons of, you know, you think, oh, finally. And then it turns out it's dry under the trees sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you got uh, less than a half an inch. But I was thinking about what we were talking about just before. If you make a new plant and you pot it up of a coleus or a sweet potato vine or a begonia, you can carry you can try to carry that over in a very sunny window inside. And by March, that's probably not going to be a very pretty plant, but you can cut that back and it'll make new growth and then make cuttings of the new growth and you can save a lot of money because you can use that to fill your those cuttings to fill your containers next spring. Well, see here, the whole time I thought, you know, I'd just been kind of losing it due to what I was starting to speak about before about, you know, all of our realities and patterns of living have changed in these last five months. And so this is the first garden season where, for instance, I have not in person gone to a garden center. So for those big pots, whereas normally I'd go and, you know, I would have either pre-ordered particular things with a design in mind, or I'd go to the garden center and kind of mix and match and make my design on the spot. I just ordered some things last minute by mail um, to put in them and kind of on the closeout sales. And, um, you know, so it wasn't maybe the best uh, thought out kind of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) But what I had done is when I saw that there was one plant I got that, you know, it just wasn't a doer. It wasn't a performer. It just didn't seem as nice as I thought it would in the mix that I was inventing um, when I placed my mail order. And so I yanked it out. And and so I had from the previous year from our mutual friend, Ken Salodi of Atlock Farm in New Jersey, who's a topiary specialist, I had a couple of coleus topiaries um, from last year, from 2019 that I grew as house plants. I kept pinching them. And I don't know what you know, again, I think it was just this kind of weird homebound year. I kept pinching and I'm like, oh, I'm going to put these in this little vase. And the windowsills have all these tiny topiaries, little little um, arrangements, not topiaries, uh, bits of <laughs> coleus from the topiary, like, um, like flower arrangements, you know, but just uh-huh. foliage. And they started rooting. And so <laughs> exactly what you said when it came time when that one plant, it was a particular begonia, looked like hell. It left a big space in the pots. 
I thought, ah, I'll take all my little water-rooted coleus out. And I did, and I put them in, and I kept it well-watered in the pot to help them adjust. And don't you know, they did what you said. They filled in. I'm just not a propagator. You know, you're a propagator. You're someone who makes more plants. That's the name of your book, Making More Plants. I can't, I can't resist it. And, and I got, in this lockdown time, I have been waste not, want not, Margaret. You know what I mean? I've been that way with the pantry, with the eating, with the, you know, everything <laughs> is like, do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's made me more conscious of use everything, don't waste anything because you're not going anywhere, kind of. Uh, it's funny. It's very home economics with plants. <laughs> Yeah, we need a word for this because we, you, I we started off it. talking about rejuvenation and maybe this is renaissance or something. We'll have to think about that. Well, it's upcycling, recycling, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's recycling. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. And so and so you said in anticipation. So I have these coleus pieces that, um, you know, I cut them off to give the other things in the pot more room to do their thing since the coleus was outpacing them. And now I've got these rooted coleus and now I'm tucking them back into holes in the pots and elsewhere and you're saying i could also think about making them putting some of them in a pot of their own for my windowsill a sunny windowsill in the winter and then pinch them again and make more cuttings for next year so i think it's it's upcycling it's right it's yeah i like it <laughs> well, something else I've, I've started to do just this week is collect seeds from some of the plants yes. especially the annuals and biennials that are sort of, they're not, some of them are going by and turning brown, the whole plant. And sometimes I just take the plant, the dead quote unquote plant and just lay it where I want those seeds to fall. But sometimes with things like Nicotiana that are still blooming, I'll just pinch off those little brown fruits, their dry fruits, and pour them into a plastic cup or a paper cup, and then pour that into a little white envelope to save for next year. And I do that with the poppies too, with the opium poppy mm. or the bread, whatever you want to call it. Pop, bread seed. Bread right. seed poppy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you see these fruits, these dry fruits, and if you tip them on their sides, the, a thousand seeds will pour out of one. Of, yes, you have to be careful. So I leave some of them in the garden so that they'll just drop their seeds where they are. Right. And then some I save the seeds and I sow them on the snow in January or February, where I want them to grow. So I'm collecting seeds. I can't. I can't believe it. I'm making cuttings. I'm collecting seeds. What's wrong with me? <laughs> right, like because you really need more plants. Oh well, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's it is. It's um. It, it, for me, it reminds me this urge that I've had that I, as I said, I don't usually have has been a little bit like my canning and preserving instinct. You know. It's yeah, a little exactly. bit like that. It's like, exactly. don't waste anything, save all the bits, turn them into soup stock, turn the freeze that, you know, or make tomato paste, can that, you know, a tomato sauce, can that, you know, it's been that way. And I don't know, it, it feels a little bit consoling in a way. So I don't know, I, I'm kind of liking it. <laughs> can, um, can you think of something, sorry to interrupt you, but can I you think know. of something in your garden that self sows? Oh, yeah. So you mentioned a couple of them, the opium poppies uh, uh, and also the Nicotiana, which right now the hummingbirds, I can always tell when the hummingbirds from farther north are starting to move. And I feel like they are. They're maybe starting to move, even though it seems very early, you know, being sort of early August. But uh, I feel like there's suddenly more in my garden. And that's what happens in August and September here is I get, instead of a couple or a few hummingbirds at a time, I get lots at a time. I think it's babies. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is. Maybe it's babies. Maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe. But they're, um, I get, but at some point during migration, I get loads and loads. It can't be that many babies. But at any rate, the, the Nicotian is a big attraction. So I've and been having. And what about your Verbena bonariensis? Do you still have that? Yes, and and that self sows. Um, that's that tall verbena with the purple heads. Uh, that definitely self sows. Um, Angelica gigas, the uh, oh, Korean Angelica. Wow. Yeah, that self sows. Um, trying to think of other things that do. Oh, some of the corridalis, the fumatory called mm -hmm. corridalis. You know, some of those self sow, like lutea, the yellow flowered one. I, that's not an annual technically, but it but it self sows. 
Um, and, it, to- and it blooms the first year from seed. My Brunnera self sows oh. in, in dry shade. Hellebores. I used, you remember when oh. hellebores were like thirty five dollars a plant. Well, if anyone had ever known that they, then you, you lift yeah. the leaves and there's a hundred hellebores under them. Right, it does the mother take plant. time. Right, but boy, and actually, it worries me because. You know, they're cre- creeping out into the gravel now in some places, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, I mow them in some places. Yeah. No, no. It's wacky. It's wacky. So. Um, well, columbines self-sow. That's a nice one. And yeah. you can save the seeds. of If you have a lot of different columbines and there's one that's particular or two that are particularly gorgeous, I'll collect the seeds of those. If it's really blue or maybe a double white one or something. And I label the little envelopes i have those i don't know what those little envelopes are made for. glassine those little glassine bags oh that would be nice no i have just white envelopes. oh yeah mm-hmm. i think they're for coins remember when yeah. we used to have yeah. coins yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh saving seeds is uh, that's the subject that i did this past week in the new york times article was it was about vegetable seeds but you're reminding me because um what you're talking about is identifying whether you want to just let a plant sort of be tipped over or tip a plant over where you want that plant to sow for next year or leave it in place. We, but we need to, and again, this, is to, this can be with vegetables or with ornamentals, we want to make a plan now before without thinking we pull all the lettuce or all the uh, cilantro or all the beans or all the peas you know a lot of these things if you're either only growing one variety or they're an open pollinated variety or both depending what it is and, and even with tomatoes a lot of the tomatoes um can do you, know, you can save seeds from safely um you know the the open pollinated or heirloom ones or whatever heirloom, right yeah yeah and i mean you know there's distancing and all this kind of stuff but a lot of us don't have 50 different kinds it's not a farm um but you know don't pull all the bush beans that are fading you know don't eat all the pods let a few go let some go and save some beans and save some peas and you know that feels good too but if we don't mark it off now like if we don't note which nicotiana we're going to leave to sow there and which we're going to collect heads from into a paper bag to put over to another place do you know what i mean it's a little strategic i think Mm -hmm. right now yeah yeah um so yeah uh anyway Uh, so you dry the beans and you store them dry just like you would with a dry bean yes and the tricky part with beans and peas is that since they're so big you first have to let them you know the pods the you, the vines stay in place, the vine and then the pods will turn brown and or tan and, ra- you know, the, the seeds, if you shake the pod on the vine, will rattle in the pod. That's the time when you harvest them. And then you open the pods, you take the beans or peas out. They're still not really dry, even though they sound dry, relatively mm-hmm. speaking. And you spread them out on a screen um, in a warm, dry, airy place. And, you know, like garage or whatever. And it can take several weeks to really to dry down to the ideal dryness to last well over the winter, you know, in storage. So the way to tell, it's hilarious, the person that I interviewed for that time story, Ken Green of Hudson Valley Seed, he, I said, how do you tell? And he said, well, you get a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and he said, well, you get a hammer and you smash one seed. And he said, if it cracks into splinters, he said, it's ready. It's down to like 7% um, moisture oh. level, which is ideal. If it's if it mashes, it's right. not ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just ruined a seed doing that. And oh. I didn't I didn't have a whole lot of seeds, but oh. I saw somebody did that and they just cracked the the outside and I thought, "Oh, that's a good idea." Instead of sanding it on a very hard seed and I it it splintered all right dead. No. But you're talking about when you have a whole lot. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and again, in order to have a whole lot of peas or bean seeds for next year, you would have to anticipate and not pick all your edible pods along the way. You'd have to be leaving some vines unpicked, right? So say you had a 10-foot row or something. 
of X number, you know, you'd have to, or even a five foot row, you'd have to say, these four over here, these vines, I'm going to let them do their thing right through to sexual maturity and seed setting, right? I'm not going to pick from those. Or I'm going to pick once, and then I'm going to let them form their second generation. I'm going to leave those. Like like the the bean pods don't split open and drop their seeds by themselves? That's why you have to keep a strict eye on it and and watch it. And so you want to get them just before that point. Um, But yeah, sure, I've had, um, I found, well, and sometimes the um, small critters, the furry guys, like the chipmunks and squirrels, they come and (laughs) split things open. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me just a few other things, because now that I'm become the master propagator over here with my jars of water and whatever, I can get some perlite. I think I have a bag in the garage. Um, what else can I do? What el- other things could I be thinking of for this futurist sort of future forward looking? Okay. Yeah. The, you know, I'm not out in the garden looking, so okay. it's, it might be hard. We got the coleus and a lot of things with square stems like plectranthus. So mint relatives, you're saying. Right. Uh-huh. And mint, but you uh-huh. know, we're not doing mint. But uh, there's a lot of ornamental plectranthus now. I mean, I can't, what's a common name? Swedish ivy doesn't really describe these plants. So no. we call them plectranthus. Yeah. And the begonias, especially the fibrous rooted begonias, either the small ones or angel wing ones, whatever you have, mm-hmm. you just can't really do that with the tuberous begonias. No. Those uh, there's so many of the ornamental sweet potatoes vines, and they root readily. Mm, what can you think of some more too? We said coleus. No, but the begonia thing I think is a good idea, and the plectranthus. That's something that you know usually people have it like trailing. There's a variegated oh, there's four one and different a ones that are silvery available. one, and yeah, yeah, and people have it trailing out of a pot and. That that would be kind of nice. Yeah, that would be kind of nice to have a supply of that. Um, there's, yeah, but- there's the hothouse geraniums too, but it's a little bit different with the geraniums. I let them callus over overnight before I stick them in the perlite. I'll, I'll put the leafy part in a plastic bag that's open and let the stems where they're cut just sit out in the air overnight. And then they, they form a kind of a callus that close off and it keeps them from rotting when they're becoming cuttings but i i know people who stick geraniums in water and they root right we you know the the worst thing that can happen she says with her vast experience doing this this year (laughs) um is is that you can have these beautiful little windowsill arrangements i mean i have enjoyed even before i noticed that they were rooting and because I didn't do it consciously saying I am propagating, I put them in, I have lots of little, you know, vases and glasses and things. And, and I put them in just because it was pretty, it was almost like having flower arrangements. Mm-hmm. And so, so the worst that can happen is you enjoy them then if it doesn't root, if the thing you choose doesn't root, right? I mean, that's the worst that can happen is that it looks pretty <laughs> for a week <laughs> in, or two. Or impatience, three. I'm still thinking. Oh, impatience, impatience. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, but it's important to take off those extra leaves underneath. That's the right, one thing. You don't thing. want those in yeah. the water, that's for sure. Right, 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 right. Um, and how long should the roots, it gets these white, like the coleus gets these really long white roots pretty quickly. An inch or two, you said, Max? Yeah, roots? I'd say longer than an inch, shorter than two. Okay. Okay. And sometimes, you know, people leave them and they end up filling the whole jar with a thou- with six-foot-long roots. And they don't really always catch on. They kind of don't do as well as the ones with shorter roots. Right, because the adjustment, as you said, to a different medium, the soil versus the water, for that established, like, foot-long root system would be kind of wild. Yeah, I, get, <laughs> I, I could get that. <laughs> And, okay. and have you ever cut your coleus or plectranthus and just stuck them in the pot where they came from? I don't think so. And again, in this year, it was so hot and dry. I would have been, oh, yeah, yeah that, nothing. You'd have to keep up with the watering of those pots right, probably right. once or twice a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the pots are big and, you know what I mean, they're out in the sun and so forth. Um, hmm. In the right year. In the right year, we can try, I'll try direct 
uh, uh, what do you call it? Sticking the cuttings. That's sticking. We'll call sticking it the sticking. cuttings. Sticking the cuttings. And if you re- if you cut the if you cut some of the leaves, if you take off some of the bottom leaves, and even cut some of those leaves in half to reduce the area of transpiration, sometimes that oh, helps right. the cutting catch on. Right. So even the leaves you leave on, you may reduce the size of to take stress off. Scissors. Okay. Okay. A clean a clean cut. Right. Right. Huh. Have we oh, confused boy. everybody too much? <laughs> no, no, no. And and again, this is a little bit of like the basic t- tiptoeing into some propagation. And again, what's the worst thing that can happen? It's going to look beautiful while you're enjoying it in the glass jar or the pot. And the best thing that can happen is you'll have sort of a mother plant, a next generation plant that will become the mother plant for right. some March or April cuttings that will go out into your garden once rooted, right? So that's the best scenario. Anyway, I just can't cut stuff off and throw it out. That's, I know, I know. <laughs> that's I my know. problem. I know. Well, Ken, we've managed to squander another. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm always glad to talk to you. And I'm glad, even though you did tease me at first, you didn't completely laugh at me for my mad propagation experiment 101 over here. So thank you. <laughs> I'll Next talk to you again 2.0. soon. Okay, okay. I'll talk to you soon. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And I hope I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. You can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or at Facebook or on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and maybe propagating meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.